everyone, and welcome to our event tonight. My name is Janie Herman, and I am the Public Programming Librarian at Princeton Public Library. I'm so thrilled to be welcoming everyone to the event on behalf of our partners, including Labyrinth Books and Doubleday. I have a few housekeeping items to touch on before I turn things over to our esteemed guests tonight. As a reminder, please keep your audio and video muted throughout the session. If you would like to submit questions for our speakers, please send them in the Zoom chat, which can be activated at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to comment along with and applaud for our speakers in the same chat box. You'll see the chat is underneath the three dots that say more on the bottom of your screen. For best viewing experience on your computer, and that's assuming you're not on a phone, uh, we suggest finding the gallery view button in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom window. Once in gallery view, if you hover over any of the black tiles with a name on it, you should see a blue ellipsis. Click on this and find hide non-video participants. This should clear up your screen so you'll only see me right now. On a mobile device, you can swipe left to access gallery view and you can hide non-video participants by tapping more and going into your meeting settings. So just please go into your settings again mute your video, mute your audio, and um, then you should just be able to see the speakers and use the chat. No. So now, now, okay, so that we still have a few people who haven't quite got there yet, and I wanna make sure we're all there. So once again, mute video, mute audio, and go into gallery view, and we should be all set so that you can see our speakers. Well, so, now you will only see our speakers once they come out onto the digital stage, which I'm going to ask them to do now. So John and Jim, could you please start your cameras and microphones to come on out and join us in the Zoom room? While our speakers are getting settled, I will introduce them. Jim McCloskey is the founder of Centurion, the first organization in the US dedicated to freeing the wrongly imprisoned. To date, Centurion has freed 63 men and women serving life or death sentences for crimes they did not commit. Today, Jim McCloskey is retired from active oversight of Centurion, though he continues to serve on the board and pursue cases in his time. He served in the US Navy, patrolling rivers in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam and spent 12 years in international consulting. He has a Master's of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. His new book, When Truth is All You Have, is a candid, compassionate chronicle of faith and doubt, triumphant success and shattering failure, and an unflagging dedication to justice. Today, he'll be joined in conversation by best-selling author and longtime criminal justice advocate, John Grisham. He is the author of 35 novels, one work of nonfiction, a collection of stories, and seven novels for young readers. His 2019 legal thriller, The Guardians, was inspired by McCloskey and Centurion's work, centering on a lawyer turned minister's efforts to exonerate an innocent man. Signed copies of both authors' books are available from Labyrinth Books, and we'll provide a link in the Zoom chat throughout tonight's conversation to help you with this. Okay. With all of that, I will now turn things over to John Grisham for our main event. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. Hi, John. How are you? Hey, Jim. How you doing? I'm fine. How you doing? Can't complain. I'm waiting for the baseball season to start next Friday. Well, I hope it starts next Friday. Uh, that's the kickoff day, huh? Yeah. That's when the Phillies start the season. A 60-game season, right? That's it. That's it. Well, it beats nothing. Uh, you're exactly right. Absolutely. Are you at home in Princeton? I am at home. Absolutely. Yeah, the same room where you were, you visited me a, over a year <laughs> ago. Uh, so I'm here. Kate's sitting in the living room, and I got my tech guy right next to me in case anything goes wrong. So I don't panic. Well, we need uh, all good Zooms need a young person somewhere near the uh, laptop to, uh, to, to get us through it. Well, when Janie was going over those directions, man, I was in another world. <clears throat> so the, the book comes out, uh, came out two days ago? Yeah, it came out on, on Tuesday. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, 
I've gotten obviously a lot of communications from a variety of people all over the country. And even a friend of mine from Japan told me he received his. So um, it's, uh, we're starting to move, see how it goes. Are you going to do a virtual book tour? Well, uh, this morning I, I had an interview with uh, a virtual interview, of course, with, with Terry Gross of uh, Fresh Air that will be broadcast next, next Tuesday. Uh, so, uh, but other than that, um, Double Day's working very hard trying to, trying to get some people interested in, in some kind of an interview. We're working on it. Well, good. Best of luck with the book. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you for volunteering to write the forward and doing so in a very, uh, in a very profound fashion. So uh, your words were much appreciated and your message was obviously as well. Jim, the, the book is, you know, as I told you when I read it, um, I was not surprised uh, to, to read the book and find it to be very, very moving and compelling and courageous. And, um, you know, I told you the story. Um, I had never heard of Centurion until 2005, 15 years ago, when I uh, went to Oklahoma to investigate and research uh, my only work of nonfiction, An Innocent Man. And I was in Mark Barrett's law office in Norman, Oklahoma. And uh, one of his junk rooms was stacked with boxes and boxes of paperwork from the case of Ron Williamson and Dennis Fritz. And uh, one of the boxes was marked uh, Centurion Ministries. And uh, I was new at the innocence work. I didn't really know much about it. I, you know, I was way in over my head. And I asked Mark, I said, uh, what is Centurion Ministries? And he said, let's go have lunch and I'll tell you all about it. And uh, he gave me, gave me the background, gave me your, you know, your biography and your work. And uh, it was uh, your, your work and your life and your uh, determination have always been inspiring to me. And you, you wrote the book, this book, it's a book I, want, I would like to write. I wish I had time to take um, my top 10 or my top 20 innocence cases of wrongful conviction stories and write them uh, smaller versions uh the innocent man took me a long time to research and write and uh i'm, I'm not sure i can devote, devote that much time to uh, a lot a, a lot of stories but the stories as you know are so um fascinating from a storytelling point of view because of the injustice, the suffering, the wasted lives, the wasted time, the wasted, the waste of people, because, um, you know, for every wrongful, wrongfully convicted person you got out of prison, uh, somebody didn't go to prison. The real culprit did not go to prison. And oftentimes, as we have learned in innocence work, the real killer, the real rapist, uh, stays out for a long time. Most of them eventually wind up in prison because they're bad people. Let me, let, me add, let me add something about that, John, because uh, now that you bring that up, uh, in thinking about what I might want to, some of the points I might want to raise this evening, um, I reflected back on the, your book on Ron Williamson. Now, it's interesting to note that two of my death row cases and your Ron Williamson have something in common. Ron uh, was exonerated after 12 years on death row based on DNA. Uh, the book, uh, you, you based your book on, on his story. Right. He, he came within five days of execution. The two death row cases that I'm, I'm referring to tonight, Clarence Branley uh, was wrongly convicted down in, in Conroe, Texas. He came within six days of execution. And then another Texas death row case that we worked on, Kerry Max Cook, he came within 11 days of execution. Now, the interesting thing, in addition to that, about all three cases is that the real killer testified against each of those three men. Uh, in Williamson, it was, uh, it was Gore who testified, mm -hmm. right? And he was eventually, the DNA eventually nailed him. And then in Clarence's case, the real killer was used by the prosecution as a star witness against Clarence Branley. Uh, and then in Kerry Max Cook case, one of the, uh, the, the real killer was uh, used as a star witness against Kerry. 
Um, so, I, I, you know, here, here we have, uh, among the number of reasons that wrongful uh, people get wrongly convicted, is so often the real perpetrator is right under the nose of the police. Yeah. And for whatever reasons, they don't, they, they disregard that or dismiss it as they go about um, with zeal to uh, build a case against uh, a suspect that they have in mind for whatever spurious reasons. Right. And it's uh, in, in Kerry Max Cook and Clarence Brantley, did the real killers um, either kill or rape again after uh, those two were convicted? They did not. In the Kerry Max Cook case, the real killer was uh, her lover for a year and a half. He was twice her age. He was her boss at uh, the university. He was a head librarian at the Texas Eastern University Library in, in Tyler, Texas. And she, he hired her as a 20-year-old young periodical clerk. And uh, for the next year and a half, they had a torrid love affair and uh, which resulted in, uh, uh, in, in her finally telling him that she's moving on. He had an explosive temper and uh, he ended up uh, killing her. Uh, now he's never prosecuted, uh, but he, he never, he, this was a singular event in his life that, uh, that killed that poor, that poor young woman. Uh, in the Clarence Brandley case, uh, he was framed by, Clarence was the, the black custodian. He was head of the custodians at a large high school in Conroe. And uh, the Texas Ranger arranged for the three other white janitors who worked for Clarence um, to, to, to jointly conspire together to build a story. And one of, those, one of those three white janitors was one of the two killers. Was he ever convicted? He was not because in both cases, the district attorney refused to admit or even to seriously consider that, uh, that uh, the, the, the two killers in the, in the Kerry Max Cook case and the Brantley case had anything to do with it because they had their mindset on killing uh, Clarence and Curry. And, and that was, uh, there was, there was no getting off of it. I did my best uh, to try and convince them um, the trial prosecutor against Curry, we went through three trials with Curry. His first conviction was reversed in, in uh, 19, um, 1986 or so, and then uh, 1988. And then he was retried in 92, 6-6 six, six hung jury, uh, retried again, uh, was, was found guilty back to death row in 94. We started all over again. We got that conviction thrown out by the high court in Texas, who found as, as their, in, in their opinion, that the entire investigation and prosecution was a fraud and was tainted uh, by manipulation uh, of evidence. And then now Curry is facing his fourth trial, his third retrial. And we had a, we had a very, very hostile judge who, was, who had made some terrible evidentiary hearings that, that uh, disenabled us from really presenting our case. So uh, much to our surprise, the district attorney decided to offer Curry a, a no low contendere without admitting guilt. Curry accepted that and uh, he was freed that very day. He had spent 22 years on Texas's death row and endured unimaginable abuse and horror among the other inmates uh, on Texas's death row. Yeah, Jim, you and I can tell these stories forever because you know, you've lived it and I've, I've read about a lot of them. Uh, but how, how often do you get the question, because I get it all the time, how do wrongful convictions happen, okay? And what, what is the first thing that goes wrong at the scene of the crime often? What, what, what's the first mistake that's made by the police, generally speaking, at the scene of the crime? Well, the first, the first thing that in, in our experience that, that we see time in and time again is for whatever reasons, the prosecution or the, the, the police rather, they have their eye on a particular suspect. And um, uh, once they have their eye on that suspect, for whatever 
uh, scant, scanty evidence they have, uh, which is usually not credible at all, uh, they start to build a case from that point. And in doing that, they have what we call tunnel vision. Yes. They ignore any other information that comes their way that might take them in a different direction towards the real perpetrator or somebody else who, who um, they might have even better reason to suspect of being involved in the case. It's That's where it starts. You see, you see it time and time again. At the scene of the crime, the police, uh, small town cops, big city cops, uh, these detectives, you know, they think they're so smart, they can almost look at a crime scene and kind of figure things out, and they get a suspect in mind, and for whatever reason, and they march off in the wrong direction. And as you say, they exclude all evidence that does not, uh, you know, buttress their case, and they will include all shaky evidence that might help their case, and they go, before you know it, they've got a case built, oftentimes built in Ron Williamson's case. When he was arrested, there was no um, fiscal evidence leaking him to the crime because he didn't do it. Uh, so once they got him in jail after five years of investigating, they began building a case with the use of jailhouse snitches, uh, bogus confessions, uh, all the stuff that they use to to build a case that, that, that shouldn't even be there while the real killer is still out. In Clarence Branley's case, and he was, uh, this is a 1980 a visiting, uh, a visiting high school was at Conroe High for a regional volleyball tournament a week before school was to start. One of the, the manager of a visiting team wandered off to a distant part of the high school looking for a restroom. And that's where she encountered uh, two of the janitors who worked for, for, for Clarence. And they, uh, they're the ones who dragged her up into the restroom and, and killed her and sexually assaulted her. Um, but here's what happened. The uh, Conroe police officer told Clarence that you are the, he, 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 I'm not gonna use the word, he said, you're the N-word, you're elected. Somebody's got to fall for this, and you're elected. Then the DA brings in a Texas Ranger who comes in five days after the crime occurred. The case is still cold. They haven't arrested anybody. The Texas Ranger with the DA, they arrest Clarence that Friday afternoon, and then they start to build their case. They had no evidence whatsoever. Then they started to build their case against Clarence by getting the three janitors together. They had what the Texas Ranger called a walkthrough. Here's what you guys are gonna say. Here's the story you're gonna to testify to. And they, they uh, implicated uh, Clarence. That's how, it, that's how it started. Yeah. Uh, how many cases have you seen bungled by the Texas Rangers? Well, that, that's the... Uh, that's the only case that uh, I, I've worked on six Texas cases, and uh, that's the only one where a Texas Ranger was was a primary investigator, or even an investigator on the case. Well, you know, we 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 talk about uh, the case of uh, Cameron Todd Willingham, who was executed in Texas in 2004, I think, yeah. uh, based on some junk science by the by the, the Texas experts. Uh, we've worked on the Joe Bryan case. Joe, Joe was finally paroled after 35 years, four months ago. Oh, uh, was, well, great. Uh, yeah, he's out. That was another uh, bogus conviction caused by the Texas Rangers. I can't figure these guys out. They want to be seen as this elite crime fighting, uh, crime fighting unit, uh, but they screw up so many cases. The, the, when, when a Texas Ranger rolls into a small town, it's like, you know, the FBI is there and they can do no wrong. And they put together these cases that cannot, that aren't true. Well, they come into town as they did in Conroe in this case with the 10 gallon hat and the big boots and the gun on their side. And uh, they're, they're, they're Mr. Clean. We're going to, we're going to clean up this and we'll have it. Don't worry, Mr. DA, we'll take care of business. Yeah. Um, and, and, so. and they're given great reverence by Texas juries. That's why you, that's why you have so many wrongful convictions out of Texas. I'm not picking on Texas. Every state's had more than their share of wrongful convictions. Well, that's another thing uh, for us to, to maybe point out. 
so juries uh, basically with no experience in the criminal justice system, um, they tend, and I, I did before I even was introduced to this work in 19, and when, I was, when I was 37 years old, I had no experience with the criminal justice system. I, I had never even been in a jury or in a courtroom. I always thought police and prosecutors care about one thing, and that's to sound Sunday schoolish, truth and justice, and that they would never lie or uh, perjure themselves or sponsor perjury. Uh, so juries have a tendency to believe the prosecution witnesses and the police on the stand. And it's, uh, it's no real big, it, it, it's no real secret among those who practice uh, criminal, just, uh, criminal justice and criminal cases that it's, it's uh, not uncommon for police to come into court and exaggerate or commit perjury, lie, in order to uh, assist the prosecutor to gain a conviction. It happens a lot. Or fabricate evidence or plant evidence or hide exculpatory evidence. It happens all the time. Exactly, exactly. So um, if, I, if I were sitting on a jury before I began this work, um, I probably, I would have, I would have believed uh, whatever the police had to say. And yeah. I think it still exists uh, in the general American public as well. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if you're a person of color and you're sitting in the dock, then the presumption of, of, of innocence goes out the window and the tendency really generally among white jurors wherever in the U.S. is when they're looking at that black male in the dock, the tendency is to presume uh, guilt rather than innocence. Uh, A question for you, Jim. Uh, your centurion, your, your magic number is now 63 exonerations. Um, I'm on the board of the Innocence Project in New York, and our number, I think, is three... 70 or something that's you know that's a lot of uh, innocent people who were convicted i think i read somewhere there have been over 2,000 exonerations in the past 25 years in the entire country by various other innocence projects and and there are many innocence projects around the country um you know some strong some barely hanging on uh but because of the so many high profile exonerations do you think there's a correlation to the fact that today we have very few death verdicts and very few executions? Is it because jurors, as you were talking about, are more skeptical of what the police and prosecutors say? Well, I, that, that could be one reason. Um, let, me, let me just add one more thing to what you just said. Um, in the, uh, among those 2,600 exonerations that have been documented that have occurred uh, since 19, that have been documented since 1989, um, 1,065 have been exonerated out of their murder convictions. They've been wrongly convicted of murder. 50% of those ex murder exonerees are black. Another 335 uh, men have been wrongly convicted and exonerated from rape and 60% of those men are black. So uh, the, the racial the racial bias that that exists, um, you know, at all levels of society in America, is certainly uh, really a, a pretty endemic part of the of the criminal justice system. Now, as far as the death row situation goes, um, fortunately, uh, and I don't know whether this accounts for less executions, but in the last three or four years, there have been a number of elected district attorneys who are more progressive and uh, uh, they want to reform the criminal justice system within their jurisdiction. And uh, as an example, Larry uh, Krasner in Philadelphia, uh, he's been in office now for, I guess, almost three years, but he, he doesn't believe in the death penalty and he's not asking for the death penalty. Whereas his predecessors, uh, they were the they, they have put more people on, Pen on Pennsylvania's death row uh, than uh, in prior years. So, um, you know, it, 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 it really, um, I think it varies uh, state by state and county by county in terms of 
how the different prosecutors look at look at uh, asking for the death penalty with, with jurors. How many of your uh, clients were on death row? Well, we've we've worked for uh, four men uh, who were on death row. Uh, the uh, besides Clarence and, and Kerry, there was Jimmy Wingo in Louisiana and Roger Coleman in Virginia. They were both executed. Um, and uh, several others, Ellen Reasonover was convicted of murder in St. Louis. She did 19 years before we exonerated her. She came within one vote of the death penalty. One juror held out against, against death. That saved her life. Uh, so, so I'm thinking of, uh, of Gary James. Uh, he was uh, convicted of murder in, uh, in Ohio. He was put on death row with his, with his co-defendant, Timmy Howard. But then um, when, when the death penalty was ruled unconstitutional, they were taken off death row and, and given life. So there have been a, a few very significant cases. How many executions have you witnessed? I haven't witnessed any. Um, although when Jimmy Wingo was executed in June of 87, I was with him for an hour uh, from seven to eight o'clock uh, before his execution at midnight that night with Roger Coleman in Virginia, uh, his young attorney, Kitty Behan and I, who worked for Roger for a number of years, trying to, uh, trying to exonerate him. We both sat outside his death cell, which was 10 yards away from the execution chamber, from the electric chair. This was in 1992. And we shared his last meal with him, which was a cold delivered pizza. Um, and uh, that, was a, that was a night I want to forget. Now, I didn't attend. I chose not to attend the, the execution. Uh, but I was with him up until about an hour before they took him away. Let's go back to your book. Uh, people want to, when they read the book, that they want to know how you, as a non-lawyer, as a non-journalist, as someone with no connection to the criminal justice system, you were a ministerial student at Princeton. How did you get in this business? Well, how did I get? Here's what happened. I was a, I was a Navy officer for three years, and then in business for twelve, half in Tokyo, half in, at my home city of Philadelphia. And uh, after being uh, working for a management consulting firm in Philadelphia throughout the seventies, I started to lose my. I started to lose my zeal and, and ambition for the business world. Um, I didn't feel as if I was leading a, a purposeful, authentic life. I was serving nobody but myself. It was very, a very selfish, superficial life. At the same time, I was going to church for the first time as an adult. And my minister was, was uh, very influential. And um, I, I, really, I couldn't wait for every Sunday morning to to listen to his sermon, uh, the gist of which was to wash the other's feet. Um, so I started to really get into the scriptures very carefully. And uh, over time, I felt that the Lord was, was calling me to leave the business world and go into the ministry. So I went up to, I consulted with only one person, and that was Dick Streeter, my minister. I didn't tell my parents or my friends or anybody what I was going to do until I actually did it. And of course, they were all stunned and shocked that I was on the way to Princeton Theological Seminary thinking I was going to be a church pastor, a Presbyterian church pastor. While there in my second year at the seminary, I did my field ed work at Trenton State Prison as a student chaplain. And I was assigned two cell blocks in the maximum security unit where they were locked in uh, 23 hours a day. And I had 40 men, each in their own cell on two cell blocks. One of those men, only one, was proclaiming his innocence to me. A number of them were giving me, were telling me what they did do. So it's, it's a canard when people say, uh, well, everybody says they're innocent. In my experience, that's not true. But anyway, I met this man, Mr. De Los Santos, and... Uh, from September through December, uh, all he would talk about when I would come up to his cell 
was how innocent he was. Long story short, he provoked me into getting uh, uh, his transcripts. I read them over Thanksgiving. I asked him a ton of questions. And then uh, he said to me, he said, well, let me, you've asked me a million questions. I have a question for you. And I said, oh boy, here we go. So he said, do you believe I'm innocent? I said, well, yes, I do. I do believe you're innocent. He said, what are you going to do about it? I said, what do you mean, what am I going to do about it? I don't, I don't know anything about uh, criminal justice or court system or uh, investigation. I, I mean, Chief, I'm a, I'm a seminary student with a business background. He said, well, look, I've been praying for somebody to come along in my life and free, man, free me, and you're the man to do it. He said, what are you going to do? Go back to this, your nice, warm, secure little seminary and pray for me? I said, well, yeah, that's what I was thinking about doing. And he, he said, he said, that's not going to free me. God works mm -hmm. through human hands. And, um, you know, he really shook me up and challenged me. So I did go back to the seminary and uh, I went into scripture and uh, to think and pray about this. And so that's what I did. I, I came across a passage in Isaiah that really moved me. In Isaiah 59, the great prophet uh, talks about how uh, justice has fallen from the public squares. Truth, there's no truth. There's no justice. The Lord wondered why this was so, and there was no one to intervene. So when I read that, I felt God was speaking directly to me, and so I decided, well, maybe I better, maybe I better the better be the interventionist for Mr. De Los Santos and. So I went in the next day and told him what I was going to do, and that started the whole thing off. How long did it take to get him out? Took two and a half years. I got a great lawyer, Paul Castellero, who, by the way, is our, he was in, had a solo practice up in Hoboken for, for uh, almost 40 years. And then in 2014, he asked Kate and me if he could join Centurion as our legal director, which he is. So Paul's been with us uh, for all 40 years of our work. He and I together uh, were able to demonstrate to the federal district court that uh, the prosecutor knew that their star witness, a jailhouse confession, jailhouse snitch, was uh, a liar and had been an informant in a number of other cases, which the trial prosecutor under direct examination had him deny. So the judge, the federal judge, uh, uh, ruled that uh, Mr. De Los Santos uh, certainly deserves a new trial and that the prosecutor knew that his star witness had lied. And he, he got freed in July. He got freed in July of, uh, of 1983, two and a half years after I met him. Okay, so after you got him out, when you, when you walked him out of prison, what, how did you feel? Well, you know, my God, uh, I just, I, first of all, it was surreal. I, because I visited him every Wednesday for two and a half years, uh, first at Trenton State Prison and then up at Rawway where they where he was transferred, and um, he and I developed a very close relationship. We really, we really liked each other and got along great. And uh, to bring him home to his wife Elena, who stood by him, Ch Chief, he was a heroin addict. He uh, he was a he had lived the life of addiction until he was 28, until he was falsely arrested for this particular Newark murder that had occurred. And he was, he was uh, to bring him home that night to the McCarter Housing Projects, or the, I'm sorry, the Kinsey Housing Projects in Newark, and for his wife to be waiting for him, she would visit him twice a week for seven years. And it was a thrill, just an absolute thrill and joy. It, it was the best day in my life up until that point. So that inspired you to, at that, at, that, at that moment, to pursue innocence work? By that time, um, after visiting him in prison, I, he had introduced me to three other New Jersey inmates who he told me were innocent of the murders for which they had been convicted. So during the time I'm working for him, I had returned to the seminary, got my degree, uh, but I started to get interested in these three other cases. And so uh, one thing led to another, and uh, I felt that, uh, you know, 
when I graduated from the seminary in the summer of 83, everything came together. Chiefy was freed. I got my MDiv degree. Now I have to make a decision. Do I go on and get ordained as a Presbyterian church pastor, or does God want me to work for these other innocent people whom I have met through Chiefy and have studied two of the three other cases, and I've come to believe that they could very well be innocent. So it was my, my call. I felt a call to um, set up Centurion Ministries, and I named Centurion after the Centurion at the foot of the cross who looked up at the crucified Christ and, and said, surely this one was innocent. So I started Centurion just to continue work on these two or three other New Jersey cases, and that's how it began. How did you survive uh, financially in those days, Jim, with no, I mean, no uh, staff, well, no office, no money? Well, by the time, by the time I freed Chiefy, I was broke. But several things happened. My parents uh, came into an extraordinary income, and uh, out of the blue, I looked at it as, as manna from heaven. They sent each of their three kids a $10,000 tax-free gift. I looked at this as a sign from God. This is your money. This is your seed money. Here it is. Go to work. Um, and then also I had it. Now I'm, uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not big on dreams and this kind of a thing. I'm not a new age guy, but when I was wrestling with what to do, go on and become a pastor or set up Centurion, uh, as it turned out, I had a dream and the dream was that I was in the Mekong Delta, which I had been in Vietnam. I'm standing on a river bank with a friend of mine and a refugee boat uh, chugs on by filled with people and all of a sudden that boat sank and all the people drowned until a, a, a helicopter comes in with seals and they go down into the deep and they, they, they bring up the people. I woke up from that dream and I again felt that uh, uh, this, was, this was another sign for me to go back into the prisons and help free these men. So with that, I said, I'm gonna start it up. Now, a couple years went by, I, Kate, thank God, she was a gift from God as well. She joined me in, in January of 87. Um, but up until that time, I was, um, you know, I ran out of money. I, well, I was down to $500 and a couple years later in 85, I was gonna get a job as a waiter in downtown Princeton, but then, a high school friend of mine, unbeknownst to me, took a collection of $1,200 and sent it up to me. And then I asked mom and dad, I hated to do it, but I asked mom and dad, can you help me out a little bit here? Which they did. And that got me, uh, that got the ship going again. And then, then, then when Kate joined me, um, after we, uh, Paul Castellera and I again, one of the three New Jersey lifers, uh, who I continued, who I started work for as Centurion was Nate Walker. We freed Nate uh, in in November of '86. That was the first blush of national publicity that that I uh, got or any of my cases got. And with that, some foundations started. They read about it, uh, and some foundations started to come our way and provided support. Um, and so things started to to build at that point. Yeah. So um, we, had, we, we had some questions coming in. I saw one question. Uh, why aren't prosecutors disbarred? I, I, guess, I guess they mean uh, corrupt or crooked prosecutors ever disbarred. Yeah. Well, um, for, first of all, I'm only, there's ver there, that's another flaw of the system. There's very little accountability for prosecutors or even police who misconduct themselves. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm only aware of two prosecutors, and maybe you know more, John, uh, who, who are actually disbarred for their misconduct at a, at a criminal trial. One was the Duke Lacrosse uh, yeah. prosecutor down there in North Carolina, um, and then the other one was uh, Michael Morton's uh, trial prosecutor in Texas, I think. But other than that, they uh, they they are. Nobody goes after them. There's no accountability. There's no transparency. Um, they're not held to account for their misdeeds in office. And they they have immunity. I mean, almost every state grants uh, statutory immunity to 
to prosecutors and to judges, uh, and there have been some corrupt judges, and then to policemen. Well, we're seeing that issue played out now with, uh, with the protests. You know, why aren't these policemen being, uh, why aren't more policemen uh, prosecuted? That's because of, for the most part, they're immune. Uh, and those statutes are granted by the state legislatures and they could be taken away. I mean, we, we need to remove the immunity so everyone is held accountable. Absolutely, and I was, I was stunned to learn that even if a prosecutor is caught suborning perjury in a criminal trial, he cannot be sued civilly. Right. He cannot be sued, yeah. which is, you know, it's just unfathomable. So let, let's talk in broad strokes here about how you do your work. You're, you're not trained as a lawyer. You're not an investigator. You're not a journalist. Um, how, do you, how do you select a case uh, to, to take and, and how do you get to the bottom of it? Where do you well, start? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly an art and not a science, but, but what our, our, our process is pretty much uh, has been in existence ever since Kate came and helped organize me decades ago. But what we do, we get from 1992 through today, we get anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 letters a year from people we never heard of asking us to help free them. Now, that's not to say, obviously, that they're all innocent, but that's the, that's the material we have to, we have to uh, sort out, the wheat from the chaff. And what we do, uh, we get hold over time. Uh, our volunteers, managed by a, some st staff people, once, a, once, a, once a, an inmate's case starts to get our attention, uh, through correspondence with that inmate and receiving some uh, documentation about the case. Before we commit to a case, and it takes three to five years to do this, when, as we're vetting all these different uh, claims of innocence that come our way, we get the entire record of the case. We get the trial transcripts, legal briefs, police reports, etc. cetera. And, uh, and then we also are interested in the character of the inmate. What kind of life was he, lead, he or she leading prior to the being falsely arrested and convicted? What's their prison record? What have they been doing for themselves in prison? By the time we come along, they've been in prison for 15, 20 years uh, with nobody in sight to help them out. So we are truly the court of last resort. And that's the whole process is capped off uh, with an interview by, well, when I was there, I retired in 2015. I would go down to prison, uh, wherever the state was, and interview that person for hours and hours and hours. Talk about him or her as a person, as an individual, but also talk about the case. And uh, by that time, um, we were pretty convinced that they were innocent. So based on that personal interview and a review of the record, then we start, we start, we go to work. And what we do there, we are the investigators. We hit the streets, whoever we may be, our staff investigators, myself and Kate. And uh, we go looking for old witnesses, new witnesses, uh, to see if anybody can shed light on the truth of the matter. Uh, and uh, also if, if, it's the, if forensics have played a part in the conviction, uh, a lot of times forensics, as you well know, are, are deeply flawed and exaggerated by the crime lab specialists, we will get we will retain our own forensic expert to uh, to run tests on the on the on the evidence and uh, help us review the forensic uh, elements of the case. And then we work with a lawyer. Now, Paul Paul has worked with us time immemorial, but uh, uh, a lot of times when I was there, uh, Paul couldn't handle all of our cases, so I would go out and retain uh, local lawyers. Uh, and together we would work to we would work to try and go back to court based on new evidence developed by Centurion uh, and try and get a post conviction relief hearing, present our evidence through witnesses and documentation, and uh, hopefully the judge will see the merit of the case and throw the conviction out. If the tr you start at the trial level and then if you get denied there, you go state appeal, state supreme. If you get denied there, you go federal courts and you go all the way through the judicial system until you get satisfaction if you're going to get it. 
Jim, explain to the, the listeners and to the future, your future readers, the difference between the cases you take are non-DNA cases and the cases that other innocence projects take that are only DNA cases. Well, uh, of the 63 people we have freed, 10 have been freed by DNA. Now, hey, if we get a good DNA case, we'll go with it. But we're the only innocence group in the United States who reinvestigates, and I'm talking about street investigation, uh, in non-DNA cases, cases that have no biological evidence at the crime scene that could assist uh, the seeker of truth to get to the truth. So we go out and reinvestigate the case throughout the United States. Now, most of the other innocence groups, uh, they depend on DNA. They take mostly only DNA. Some will do non-DNA, but in those cases, uh, they, would, they would only take those cases that are local to their, to their own uh, jurisdiction. We go all over the United States, and even in the Canada, we freed two Canadians, one out of Saskatoon and, and uh, one out of Winnipeg uh, years ago. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's what distinguishes us from all these other innocence uh, organizations. I was going to ask you, uh, of 63 exonerations, you just, I think, answered the question. You, you basically go coast to coast and even in Canada. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of years of traveling alone for you, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I spent, uh, well, from 1980 until 2015, uh, what's that, 35 years. I was probably on the road uh, doing this kind of investigative work 40% uh, 50% 40, 40 of the time. And uh, so, yeah, I was, I was, but hey, John, I got to tell you, truth be known, I'm basically a loner. Uh, and I don't mind that. Uh, I, I, it gives me the complete freedom to, to, to do what I need to do when I need to do it. Well, I'll tell a little story. About 15 years ago, you invited me to Princeton for your annual fundraiser. And, uh, and I was happy to go. We had a big party. And I think there were 15 of your guys there, uh, and I think one lady uh, was there, and Brian Dennehy, Brian your old buddy, was there, and he was kind of the MC. It was just a wonderful celebration, and we have, we have photographs of, uh, of all of us together, and to see these 15 people who owed their freedom uh, to you, and because of your perseverance and determination and guts, uh, it was extremely moving, as this work can often be. Well, let me let me just add one. Thing. First, you're you're right there, and uh, uh, but it's just not me. It's Kate German, who's been with me for God since 1987. Uh, it's Paul Castellero. It's uh, our staff and volunteers. This is a real team effort. Uh, now, when I talk about doing investigation, yeah, I, I was the investigator for uh, those particular cases, but backing me up and working with me uh, uh, were, uh, is a tremendous cadre of Centurion staff members, volunteers, and then um, outside people who we retain to, to work with us. So we could not do, when Kate and I hit the field and do our investigation, as well as the other Centurion investigators, we can't do our work without the, I mean, the work that goes into preparing a case for, to vetting a case, that's done by our staff. That's done by our volunteers. Um, and uh, we, could, we would never take a case without their labor and their, their work in helping us to vet the cases. Yeah. So the credit belongs to the entire organization, believe me. You said it takes uh, normally between three and five years for you guys to vet the case. Right. Decide whether or not to take the case. Yep. Um, when, you're, when, you're, when you're vetting these letters you get, and by the way, when I visited your office, uh, Kate explained to me how you guys answer every letter, which is every, re remarkable. Every uh, single letter gets answered, absolutely. And so you take three to five years to study the case before you take it. Uh, from that point on, what's the average uh, time it takes to get right. an person out? Yeah, uh, the average time is once we commit to the case, begin our investigation from that point on until we free them, is five to 10 years. Now, there have been exceptions to that. 
I'm working for Ben Spencer in Dallas, Texas, who's been in prison for 33 years. I've been working for him for 20 years. And, uh, you know, that's a long story, uh, but uh, we, we think we might be on the road to, to finally freeing him, but time will tell. Um, but it's a long, it's a long process. Five to 10 years is the average. On occasion, two separate cases, we freed them within a year and a half. Now that's magic. Every, all the stars align and come together. Both of those cases, as it turned out, were Dallas, Texas cases. Yeah. Uh, but it's a long road. So when we first hear from them until the time we bring them home to their family, we're talking a good 15 years. Wow. Now, before I know, I, I, I see Janie there. Um, before we finish our conversation, I really want to uh, give credit to Phil Lerman, the co-writer of this book. Uh, he really, he really brought this thing to life uh, with, with his prose. We worked really well together as a team, and this is truly a joint venture between us. And we were then aided to bring it into real final shape by uh, Yaniv Soha, the senior editor at Doubleday, and his team up there. So, uh, if if people like the book and they find it to be very readable, it's a it was a team effort as well between. The Doubleday folks, Phil Lerman, Lern Lerman, and myself. Well, the book is very readable. Uh, the, the, the only complaint I have with the book, it's not nearly thick enough because you, <laughs> you highlight some of your greatest, your greatest hits, your greatest stories. And as you know, uh, each of these stories, each of your 63 exonerees deserves a book because the stories are so amazing and fantastic and sad. And, uh, you know, it's, they're, they're just compelling stories. And, and, and tragic, it seems extremely tragic. Well, that was that was one of the struggles I had is deciding which cases to to uh, to present in the book. There's a lot of cases that are not that we worked on that deserve equally deserve as much attention as the ones that were presented in the book. And I I kind of feel bad for those folks, and I hope they understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think James says we're out of time, Jim. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. Good seeing you. Well, again. yeah, you, you can stay online here a little bit. We've got a few questions from the audience that I'm going to moderate. Uh, some are for John and some are for Jim. Sure. Um, so if you can both stay online, uh, that yep. would be great. Uh, the first question comes from Jared uh, Mobley, who wants, and um, this is one, is for Jim. Um, and that is, he's want to, interested in your take on what you think might be the percent or number of wrongful, wrongful convictions in the U.S. right now. Um, and that the guardians, while fiction seems to portray a system that has more than a few wrongful convictions and maybe way too many. So it does raise the question, how many convictions are wrongful? Yeah, that's a good question. And the way I answer that, you know, there are 2.2 million people in, in jails and prisons, state and federal in the United States. There are 1,300,000 and some odd people in state prisons. We only take state cases. We don't take federal cases. And of the state cases that we take, they're only murder and or sexual assault where the uh, defendant has received a, a life or death sentence. Um, of those 1,300, um, I'm sorry, 1,300,000 state inmates, um, about 350,000 have been convicted and are in prison for murder and or sexual assault. So of those 350,000 people, um, I can't tell you, nobody knows how many of them uh, are innocent and still languishing in prison. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, although I can't prove it, if one out of 10 of those people uh, are innocent. Now, as far as, the, as far as the other million goes, uh, half of whom are in prison for nonviolent offenses, uh, I can't make a judgment. You know, Jim, we get that we get that question too at the Innocence Project all the time. Uh, how many innocent people are in prison? It's a very simple question with no answer because no one has the time, resources, or personnel to investigate these cases, uh, even to take them with serious cases. No one, we, you will never know how many innocent people are there. Uh, they there are estimates ranging from two percent to five percent to you said ten percent. Uh, but whatever the number, there's still tens of thousands of innocent people in prison. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yep. And most, most, Jim, most white people don't believe that. 
Okay. I know. I know. The, uh, I'll, say that, I'll say that in front of a white audience, yeah. and uh, it's, uh, they're all skeptical. I say it in front of a black audience, they know the truth. They've lived it. But most, most white people do not believe there are thousands of innocent people in prison, and they are there. Well, there's just no question that the, the racial injustice that, that uh, sweeps through the criminal justice system in the United States and results in so many more people of color getting wrongly convicted and being in prison for something they had nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, sad, it's a sad statement to make, but it's true. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, and our next question is for Mr. Grisham. Uh, from Patrick Flynn, and he wanted to know if you could speak about the experience about um, how the translation to the screen of your nonfiction work, The Innocent Man, um, to the Netflix series, and how that came about, and what the process was, and... Um, yeah, uh, yeah. very easy qu a question to answer because I had nothing to do with it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, stay, I stayed away from it, uh, as I've stayed away from all movies, uh, but, but a very talented young a documentary filmmaker wanted to do it for Netflix and he finally convinced them had a good producer and Netflix put up the money and uh, it was very well done. Uh, told the story in six parts and uh, reached a big audience and uh, I was very, very pleased with it. It's not, it's not my story. This is a true story. It's really happened to real people. I, I just kind of came along later and put the facts together and then the filmmaker did a wonderful job. Okay. Great, that's a great answer. Um, so this is from Bart Mitchell and Susan Siebert for Jim, um, who say that you have an amazing mind, faith, and joy about life. And they want to know about your family and how you grew up and how you think that shows up and what you've chosen to how you've chosen to live your life and carry out your amazing vocation. Well, uh, truth be told, the Sieberts are good friends of my sister and myself. So good, good to have them joining us <laughs> joining us tonight. Uh, but listen, uh, Lois, my sister, who's a, a professor of public health at Boston U, and my brother, retired, successful businessman, the three of us were raised by mom and dad, and uh, we were so fortunate and blessed to have parents like we did. They supported us. Uh, they supported us in so many different ways. Uh, both we were kind of uh, kind of an affluent family relative to our other to our our contemporaries. And uh, it was always drummed in us, we're going to college, and we did. And then um, uh, my mom got polio when she, was, when she was 30 years old and paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, that was in 1947. And she had Lois, my sister, in 1954, uh, even in that condition. Uh, dad, uh, mom was the love of dad's life. And uh, uh, he, he was devoted to her and took care of her and the family. So there was much love in our family. Now, Lois is 12 years younger than I am, and um, I teased the hell out of her. And um, she got me in high, in, when I was a senior in high school and she was in six years old, and I was smoking at the time, and I was teasing the heck out of her. And at the dinner table in front of mom and dad, she bursts out and says, Jimmy smokes, Jimmy smokes. So she, she busted me and got me back. But um, anyway, it was, a, it was a great family life. Mom and dad are both deceased. Um, and uh, we're very blessed to have them. Great. Um, so this question is from uh, Teresa Canali. She wants to know, um, in general, for, for both of you, like taking on a case, uh, do our only cases accepted where the sentence or remaining time is of a certain length? Is that a determination in accepting the case that the sentence has to be of a certain length? Yeah, we, we uh, Centurion, we can only speak for Centurion, and that is we only take cases where the person is doing life or death. Okay. Yes. So the, the, wow. most, the most serious of situations. Okay. So we have people here who are just commenting that they're totally in awe of your work and um, and giving <coughs> shouts out to Kate and Paul and the entire staff and someone wanting to know if Kate could make an appearance on here tonight. I know Kate is there in in the room with you or at your house with you, Jim. Yeah. Um, the library had the great joy of working with Kate uh, several times, once for one of our TEDx events where she spoke and another time where we hosted 
an exhibit at the library of the work done by your photographer for the innocence um, of, 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 the, of the people that you had uh, freed. That was a really big hit of an exhibit for us at the library. We really enjoy working with Centurion every chance that we can get. Um, so there's another question <coughs> here. Um, well, let me just say something, uh, Kate. Yeah. Oh, dear. Huh? Come on up. Oh, yeah. is Kate there? Yeah, she's right here. Hold, hold on for one second, if, if we can. You can put that put that shot of bourbon down. <laughs> okay. Tequila. All right, there you go. There's, Hi there. There she, there's, there she is in the flesh, Kate Germont. Um, one yeah. tequila later. Um, <laughs> hey, John. Hey, Kate, how you doing? Good, <laughs> really good. But You're Kate, good? when we when we uh, when Paul Kessler and I freed Nate Walker out of a life sentence for a rape in November of '86, she read about uh, us and the and that case in the New York Times and uh, came forward as initially as a volunteer, and then in January of 1987, uh, she joined me, and together we have worked. Uh, ever since then together. And without her, Centurion would not have developed as it has, believe me. Well, it, we, we grew the organization together. Yeah, we did. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is uh, going to be our last question. There's so many more great questions here in the chat. And I think we could be here uh, for another hour just answering these questions and talking because you're both great conversationalists. Um, but this question is, is interesting because it is true that in recent years, uh, true crime podcasts um, have called public attention to prob probable wrong convictions and seem to have had an influence on the courts. And people just love to listen to their podcasts, the Curtis Flowers case being an example. So um, have either of you or has Centurion in particular or maybe, you know, um, John, with your influence, considered to do uh, some kind of podcast series based upon these cases in the Innocence Project and Centurion to help get more people freed? Well, just one, one uh, we, um, the writer of The Atlantic, uh, The Atlantic uh, did a 7,000 word feature story on the Ben Spencer case, the, the man who was still in prison after 33 years in Dallas. And uh, The Atlantic did a podcast, Barbara, also did a podcast in addition to writing that feature story about Ben. That's the only podcast experience I personally have had. Uh, John, what, uh, how about you? Uh, not, nothing, uh, t nothing to do with innocence. Um, a board member friend of mine in New York, Jason Flom, who's a well-known music promoter, has a podcast where he talks about uh, nothing but innocence cases. And he's very passionate about the work. He travels everywhere. Uh, trying to get inmates out. He's now done a hundred episodes and uh, has a big following. Uh, and it's, they're very well done. They're very enjoyable and they're very informative. Uh, but that's that's the only one I know of right now. So what was the name of that podcast? Uh, what's the name of it? Uh, just Google Jason Flom, F-L-O-M. And F -L -O -M. Uh, yeah, it, it'll be easy to find. That sounds really interesting. So there you go. We do have a podcast that's out there that's doing that work. Um, but there's also certainly lots of people here in the comments commenting that it sounds like this book will need a follow-up to explore more of the cases. Um, and again, maybe we can get your photo exhibit out in more places in the community because that really does tell the story as well. Um, I'm having a moment where I can't remember the name of the wonderful photographer. Diane Bledecki. Yeah, Bl Diane Bledecki. Diane right. Bledecki, yeah, she's unbelievable, yeah. Yeah, she does really great work um, photographing the people that have um, you worked with and, and telling their stories through photos, which is just another way to reach people and, and for people to see the humanity um, of what's happening in these cases. So, as I said, we could be here all night, but at this point, I'm gonna just say thank you, Jim, and thank you, John, uh, for both of you spending your time here with me. and congratulations to Jim on the release of this book. Um, it must feel great to have it out in the world. Um, it's been a spectacular conversation tonight. Um, I want to thank Labyrinth Books, of course, um, for helping to sponsor and get the word out and Double Day for hosting with us. And thank you to everyone for watching. That I've been watching the chat go by. It's been a great audience. Um, lots of great conversation and sharing of, of uh, items in there. 
Um, I even see there was a request in there from somebody and maybe we can, we'll forward that on to uh, Jim about finding a lawyer for somebody in Arizona. So we'll make sure that that gets forwarded. Um, and as a reminder, you can purchase signed copies of both, oh, signed copies of Jim's book and also copies of uh, Mr. Grisham's books from Labyrinth Books. You can do it in person or over the phone if you're in the area, or you can do online, labyrinthbooks.com, use the code Centurion to get free shipping and also to ensure that 10% of the proceeds go to help support further work for Centurion. And to learn more about Centurion, please visit centurion.org. To find out more about future events by the library, visit our website at princetonlibrary.org. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Crowdcast, and our username there is PrincetonPL. And that's where uh, Crowdcast is where you'll see a lot of our author events. We have some really great author events planned for the fall that you won't want to miss, and we'd love to have you back with us again. Um, so at this point, I'm going to just have closing words from Mr. Grisham and Mr. McCloskey, and then we're going to say good night to everybody. Uh, I feel privileged to be here. I've been a big admirer of Jim McCloskey's for a long time. He's, he's too modest to talk about all of his successes, but he's had a great career. And when you're around his men, as he calls them, his guys, uh, and you see the love and the gratitude they have for him, it's, uh, it's very emotional. But I'm, I'm happy to be involved, happy to read the book, happy to write the forward, and happy to know Jim McCloskey. Great. Well, yeah, I, I'm really, really humbled by that, by that, uh, those sentiments, John. And you have been such a huge supporter of ours over the years. And um, you've given us support in so many different ways. And uh, you are, you, through your work, you have helped to free people yourself. So let's not, let's not under, understate that as well, through your writings and your advocacy and your speeches. And I know that uh, uh, you played an, a, a significant role in freeing Carl Fontenot out in, uh, out in Oklahoma. And, and it looks like uh, maybe Tommy Ward might be on his way out after 35 years as well. Uh, you brought their, their case to the attention of the world in, in the, uh, the, the Innocence uh, TV series, um, as well as your book. So um, thank you, John, for all that you've done for us. And thank you, Janie, for the library. And it's an honor for me to be associated with the Princeton Public Library, as well as the Labyrinth the great Labyrinth Bookstore of Princeton. So um, this has been an honor for me and uh, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. And then if you want some more to hear of Jim, and remember next week on NPR on Tuesday, what do you say, three and nine o'clock? Well, in the, in the, the fresh air? From, I understand that the fresh air is on, at, on different times in different localities. Here in the Princeton, Philadelphia area, it's three o'clock in the afternoon and then repeat it again at seven in the evening. Okay, so you can hear more um, from Jim and uh, good luck to both of you with all of your future books and your promotions and of course, good, and with your continued work in helping uh, free the innocents. So this is signing off from our great event tonight. Thank you to everybody who joined us and um, everybody wave goodbye. Thank you, thank you, John. <laughs> See you later, buddy. Take care. Bye -bye. See you, Jim. All right. Take care. Yeah.